zu unserem Speaker. Um, ich habe ihn dieses Jahr tatsächlich nicht persönlich. Hi, from your gehört, translators team. Um, the speaker is Resource yeah, FM. I've just yeah, heard from him this year first. Um, some of you might have seen it on FIFA's blog, so I'm welcoming criticality of resources. When will the bomb go up? Martin Hildebrandt. Right. Hi and good evening. I'm glad that it got so full at 10 o'clock. I thought it would be for your people, for those that do not know me and asking themselves, who is this guy? I am Martin Hillenbrandt and I'm currently studying at the Augsburg University in Bavaria and I'm studying economical engineering and as a student uh, in more than one case I got to know this concept of welfare or wealth criticality and that oh no raw materials criticality and that's what I want to talk about to give you an idea about how raw materials criticality can be evaluated and what it actually means about myself as I said I am doing a podcast at ressourcen.fm about material and energy raw materials. This is not going to be about any individual raw materials. I'm going to touch upon that briefly, but it's going to be about a method how to evaluate their criticality. <coughs> I have distributed this, uh, divided this talk into four parts. Um, um, basics at first, which may be new to some of you. Then I'm going to talk about the 3TG materials and explain what 3TG actually stands for. Who of you actually knows what 3TG stands for? Show up, please. Okay, uh, you're in the right place if you don't know, because you'll know after the talk. And the third item will be criticality analysis. And the fourth, if we have time for that, and if I'm not getting pushed off the stage, I will be talking about the future, how these methods could be developed further and how we can progress. But let's jump right in. I have a very colorful, very chaotic, maybe chaotic diagram here, and that shows how raw, material are, raw materials are gained. Commodities, I had a small legend explaining the three main colors. The orange for the parts relating to materials, green relates to processes, and blue re relates to products. What, now, relating to materials, that is, you have to see it this way. That is where you know what's inside. You have ores being uh, mined. We you know it's a aluminium ore or a gold ore, and uh, this is then refined and uh, processed. And we still know that there's gold or aluminium inside. And uh, then there is. Uh, then we get to a certain uh, a border. Uh, 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 where the knowledge was actually inside disappears. I have brought one, uh, such a product with me. This is aluminium foil. Okay, that is simple. Most of you will know that it does contain aluminium. But there is a second product I brought with me, and that is a lighter. And that has this, this wheel that creates friction. And I assume that some of you know what that is made of. One of you knows. Right. So that contains rare earths. Um, if you want to show off at a party, uh, then you can say, I've got raw earths in my pocket. Maybe don't do that. Okay, never mind. And uh, also, you know, that from this point in time, you don't really know anymore what's inside. And uh, if you look further, there, uh, there's a number of steps coming after that. So it's use. Then there's the end of life of the product. When it will have to be dealt with by depositing or reusing or other means. But there are other items that you may not so well. There is one item here called dissipation, and that is the fine distribution of the materials, and that happens across all the other stations. So, in a mine, if you mine for any, uh, any materials, you uh, have wastewater, you have uh, dust, and the same applies to um, refining and up to the point of use. Classically, if you drop your phone into the sea, then it's gone, it's not deposited, it's not waste. I hope you know that. In any case, that is when it's dissipated, you cannot regain it, you cannot reuse it. At the end of life, 
there is not just depositing in, in, in landfills, but there are these various uh, re-phases. And um, three of these are in blue and three in green. You have recycling, which you know where the mobile phone gets shredded and made into a new product. Remanufacturing, mostly uh, grouped under recycling, but this is about taking individual components from the product that are still good and reusing those. Say you have an electric car and the bat battery isn't as good uh, anymore and you replace the battery, you take it out and, and use it as an uh, energy store somewhere in the house, maybe. Reuse is where you have a product that you don't really want to use anymore. You have an old mobile phone, perhaps, and there are always new phones coming out, and they're coming out faster and faster, and we Germans may say, okay, it's still good, I'm, uh, I might still use it, but I want to get rid of it because I want a new one. So what happens to the old mobile? Some throw it away, some say, okay, I'm going to build a weather station out of that or whatever, I'm going to repurpose it. And that is reuse. And the other three phases that I've, I've depicted in green are process-related. And they, are, they affect all the processes. At every station there is reduce. Clearly, you try to use less of the material. There are permanent magnets. The, um, they contain neodyme, which is a very rare material. The price has risen sharply in the last few years, so you try to use, reduce the use of that. There's a classical bias before reduce. Redesign in a car, you had heavy bodies, and uh, you try to reduce those now to, to to save weight, but also raw materials. And refuse, that may be not so clear, not so well known. You prohibit the use of certain materials, such as uh, uh, carbonated flor fluoride uh, in, in cooling agents uh, that has been banned. But if people say, if customers say we don't want to use it any any anymore, that is part of refuse as well. The second thing that's going to be important is the so-called McKelvey diagram. Don't be afraid. This may be a bit difficult to take in, but what you should remember from this is the reserves and the resources. The big division here is between reserves. Whenever we talk about reserves, it's about things you can find in the ground that can be can be mined in a profitable way at current market prices, current technologies. And at the same time, I know that these occurrences are there. You know uh, that they're in the ground, you know where they are and at which quality they are there. About resources, it's kind of different. You have occurrences that may not be able to be exploited profitably, or they haven't been discovered yet. So I, I, I suspect or I deduce that hypothetically something should be there, because on the right, perhaps I have an occurrence and on the left of it, and you could then assume or at least suspect that in the middle you have another uh, place to exploit. And now, why is this, is this relevant? You'll find that out later. The resource bases at the bottom here, that would be raw materials that I can gain from, say, seawater. Not that relevant because that is quite far away in the future, but for completeness I've included them here as well. Right, now that gets me to the second item, um, the three TG materials. Um, okay. uh, I'll talk more about that because just uh, very few people said that they know what TG is. So it's about uh, three well materials, um, and so they, they use the the English words in German as well because uh, in in German it doesn't sound good if you say TG, uh, but it doesn't start with those. Okay, so you see the names here, um, but why is this relevant? Why do I talk about that? So those three TG materials uh, are often called uh, conflict resources. What's that? They are clearly defined what it is, well, you, you may think, but they are actually defined differently in different countries. So the first thing is that you have the US um, definition. Um, they say conflict resources are resources which are um, exploited in Congo and uh, well other countries around Congo. Why? Because they are uh, known for uh, civil wars, for not being very secure. Um, so, and those 3TG materials 
um, are suspected to well enhance these uh, conflicts because uh, war groups and warlords exploit those uh, materials, sell them, and then finance their civil wars with them further. So this is why you asked the U.S. said we want to surveil that and we want to check that and we want to prohibit it. Um, and so they try to 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 reduce the use of 3TG materials and go to. Uh, other similar materials that is not conflict written. Uh, the European Union, they, they have said, well, it's wall worldwide and uh, potentially everything. So they didn't, um, they have a much more broad definition of that. So, for example, you have had diamonds, um, fossil oil, stuff like that, uh, rare woods, uh, drugs. Because uh, diamonds have been known, for example, diamonds, you know that they have been used for uh, financing conflicts and, and civil wars. Not that much today, but still it is. For the 3TG, it's the same. They have been used a lot for financing wars, but now it's it's this is reduced. But other examples are like cocoa, um, cotton, and other stuff. So this is this supports and, and finances conflicts. A BRD, which is like the uh, well Republic of Germany, um, they also they had a, they have their own definition. Um, so this is about legal stuff. Okay, but I wanted to say what 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 are those uh, resources actually used for, and why are they, they relevant for us in in Europe? Uh, for example, gold. Gold in case of gold nuggets, it's uh, well, it's just in jewelry. But especially it's in gold, as gold contacts on uh, like uh, on your smartphone. Uh, I, I suppose most of you have a smartphone with you. Yeah, so all the hands are raised. Um, yeah, it's a hacker congress. Of course you have. So in all of those devices, there's gold in there. Um, also, usually you have uh, like Wolfram, which is used for um, filament um, that was used to that, but it isn't used anymore. Um, uh, if you have like a touch display where you just have a button that is like indicated but not actually there and you have uh, a, an engine in, in the back which actually um, vibrates for you and this is done this is usually a, a Wolf, uh, an engine done by uh, tungsten sorry yeah. so it's an, and in many like tantar so so it's another rare, so you see a picture of a single crystal and a lot of technology uh, devices this is in there and mostly it is not replaceable. Um, yeah, it's tan tantal, yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, it's also in chemistry it's used a lot and there you have a lot of like uh, places where it's uh, used well in tin yeah of course you can use it for soldering um, usually but uh, also in your display uh, they're like tin display well displays use tin so you see that's relevant uh, and it's relevant where those uh, resources come from um, so usually the like the People say, well, this is the region where those uh, things come from. It's the African region of the big seas. Uh, so the production, the Great Lakes, um, sorry, the Great Lakes from the um, from Africa. And so they, well, they checked. Uh, th this is the data that is uh, published by the US. And see, in, the, in Europe, there's not a lot of those resources. Uh, you see 4% in Austria, because Austria has a big mine of... of uh, one of those. North America, you see, yeah, there's also just a bit of gold. South America eh, does have some stuff. Russia has a lot of uh, gold, uh, tantal and tin. Um, but uh, here the, we said everything comes from Africa, so we see Africa has a lot of tantal, but um, so the data actually contradicts um, what is usually said about those resources, because there's a lot of stuff that comes from Asia, actually. Um, and this is something that is in the European definition, but not in the American or the US uh, definition. So there is the suspicion that uh, some stuff is brought to, uh, to Asia and then like, f well, whitewashed there. 
But if we look at the reserves, and the reserves now, you maybe you remember the definition we brought before. So actually, Asia and Russia do have a lot of reserves of those uh, resources. So this doesn't fit that it's just kind of uh, just whitewashing. Be careful, these are just American, this is just American data. Uh, actually, we don't, the, the database is very unclear for those things. Um, so that's why, well, enjoy this, uh, so use this carefully. It's not, uh, America doesn't have, well, submitted any data, so for the US. So they, for example, they don't know, um, they say they don't know the data, or maybe they don't uh, publish it for political reasons, we don't know, but yeah. So now a uh, criticality analysis and uh, what are like the, uh, what are, will be the results of this? Uh, like a quantitative analysis, as a company, for example, you could do a vulnerability um, study. So you would look at which um, resources for technologies are we using, for example. What happens if the resource is exhausted? Could we survive or not? If you look at the um, delivery um, analysis, um, there, for example, at uh, Fraunhofer Institute I worked, uh, it's very difficult because the providers of the materials don't actually know where they're from. So we looked at Tantal and they couldn't say us where it is from. Um, so that actually surprised me because it's really difficult to find out. So we don't want to do that today. Good that I talked about it. Um, resource criticality, that's what we want to look at now. An economic um, analysis. I don't want to uh, look at social uh, impacts because then we would sit here the whole evening. But we should also, um, you should keep in mind that I only look at the ecologic, um, at the economic um, reasons. And then maybe we have time to discuss what as a company or as a country you could do. Uh, okay, um, the problems and how you do it, I actually looked at, uh, I explained a bit. We had a problem that uh, the data quality was very bad. So, uh, and we have data from very different places. And data that is not really um, relatable, like they are like day and night differences. Uh, so bring that down to one number is also important because we don't want like 10 or 20 numbers. That uh, just one number that tells me is it critical or not. So we um, guessed missing data with um, geometric uh, um, assumption, uh, deviation. Um, then we did that with every country for 10,000 uh, months and then we so um, zero in this case is good and 100 is bad. And we have this analytical hierarchy process um, which gives you ways of weighing up the different factors. If you didn't understand that, don't worry, I'll come back to it and explain a bit more. Now, 11 indicators we used, with it, with which we grouped into four categories. And when I say we, it is myself and two co-students that supported me and with whom I've worked on this. So I have 11 indicators grouped into four categories. And I would suggest that we simply go through all these indicators and discuss what we do with them. The first risk indicator is the risk of reduction of supply. Uh, so you have static reservoir reach static resource reach and end-of-life recycling rate. The static reach is something you can imagine to be you have the reservoir, uh, the amount of material that you suspect is there, and divide that by the amount that is produced every year. And that gives you a number of years. So, so you can say for 10 years, I can go on doing it as I have before. And you can see that that is static. The Cup of Rome brought out a report in the 90s that said, or in the 70s, that said uh, in the year 2000, all the resources will have been exhausted. And people said, OK, that's kind of bad and we have to do something. Uh, and now we have the year 2020. We're still here. We're still alive. So. Um, it can't be quite right, and it isn't quite right in this case either, because reserves, resources are not fixed. 
if market prices rise, um, the demand rises, and if demand rises, uh, you have more people uh, providing supplies. Uh, people are just retrieving more, producing more, and that changes things. Uh, raises amounts, so, but that is an indicator that tells us where we are at the moment. Regarding the end-of-life recycling rate, this is the product's end-of-life, not the recycling rates during the process. The federal government kind of confuses these two and, and that makes it's, everything seem fine. But this is about the recycling rate at the end of life of the product. And there are various data sources here. I've given the, the liter literature sources here that these are the sources we used. Like I said, we had to norm the whole thing, and again, we had it on a scale of one, 0 to 100. And I brought some data with me. For example, you can see here the static reserve reach and the static resource reach, are, or the, you can say, okay, 103 years looks good, but if you have tin with 16.9 uh, years, that isn't that good. So depending on how prices change, how quickly projects can be implemented, that, that might become pretty critical. Regarding the recycling rate, you can see that there is still potential here. Uh, it's 39% is, is kind of good, but by no means perfect. But now, finally, we come to the indicators that we calculated. Who of you knows box plot diagrams? Okay, some of you do. I'll take a br brief a box plot uh, diagram shows you a middle value, an average or median, and that uh, and that is adorned with a box. The so-called confidence interval of say 15%, and uh, so the the colored box is the 95% interval, and and the um, <coughs> and the, the whiskers are the 95% confidence, and and the colored box is the 50% interval. And we've calculated these indicators for these uh, all these materials and you see that one of them is an, an actual outlier that is tantalum. Um, so the uh, amount of time left in reserves is quite low and and resources. Uh, but basically the reason for this is that the data is chaotic and and we have don't know. To, uh, to from from okay to don't know to oh, we are going to die and we are going to use it, but you can't say that we are fairly critical here uh, in the near the 100 value for three materials and and recycling rate doesn't look that good either. Now the second category of indicators. Let's see if things get better here. This is the risk of extended uh, demand. So we have coupled production. You have. Uh, say you have a production of one main material, tungsten, but there is a mine that just doesn't just mine tungsten, but other products as well. But the actual operating of the mine is determined by the price of tungsten. So uh, if you... Uh, we kind of try to link the main products and the coupled products together and... Uh, and this is about extended supply, uh, extended demand. If demand rises, the mine may not be able to su supply the uh, amount of the coupled products. And uh, the demand for future technologies is the second indicator. So we have estimated what the demand in 2030 with new technologies will be compared to the production, the annual production rate at the moment. And last, we have the substitutability. Uh, the uh, degree to which uh, a material can be substituted. Uh, in the best case, I have something that is n not radioactive. In the worst case, you have uranium, which is also a very dense material, just like tungsten is. Uh, but um, sometimes you can replace a material and sometimes you cannot. This is a not very clear diagram, but we've worked with these kind of diagrams. This comes from the UN originally, and we've looked at the coupled products which belong to which main products. You have a substitution, uh, statements about substitution. Tungsten is not very well substitutable. The others are in the middle ground. You have percentage figures, how much the uh, demand is going to rise uh, with new technologies until 2030. So 205% above the current demand 
for tungsten, that is a bit much. And uh, same with gold. And uh, this is about new technologies and everything that's currently available is uh, also going on. And again, we uh, calculated indicator values. First for the coupled production, that looks fairly good. As you can see in that diagram, everything is in the margin, it's about 10%. So, uh, demanding uh, regarding demand with future technologies, it looks uh, worse, with the exception of tin. Uh, tin is okay, and the other three are not looking good. Substitutability, we are in the middle area, or perhaps uh, in the good area regarding tungsten, and tantalum. If you use that as a uh, compound, uh, it gets more difficult. Now, to the third category, the concentration risk. Uh, we've used something which is called the herfindahl hirschman Index. If you are involved with economics at all, you know this. This is about uh, measuring market concentration. This indicator, this index, takes values from 0 to 10,000, and basically it's the squared share of production per land summed up. So you have countries that produce a lot. Oh, I'll just show you the graphics, then it will get more, more understandable. Now, raw materials that are uh, mined in just a few countries have a high index, and those where it, the supply is spread across different countries have a lower index, which is the case with gold, for example. The Americans and Europeans have different interpretations. Again, the Americans say that a value of above 2,500 is critical. The Americans say what above 100 is, is problematic. And uh, looking at, at the um, these three, these four materials that were selected, each one except gold reached critical levels. And again, in the diagram, gold looks good regarding country concentration, and the other three look bad. Why is the uh, company concentration worse? Well, we have some countries where these resources are mined, but we have multinational com companies, corporations that work in several countries. So that reduces the market to these few companies, leading to a higher concentration and therefore a higher risk. Uh, of course, few companies, you see it with OPEC, they can strongly influence the price. Regarding tantalum, for example, you have the case that company concentration is not regarding, does not refer to the mining companies, but those that do further processing. Because mining, uh, is often uh, done in mines where people where people work in slave-like conditions and human rights are ignored. And you cannot really say that they're using uh, machinery. They are. F this is forced labor. They have very bad conditions. And people try to influence this, but this is not reflected in this diagram because the multinational corporations are only in the second stage of this process when it comes to further processing. Now, to something a bit more social. Geopolitical risks, or how, uh, how secure are those countries or safe? So you have political stability. Um, so all of those three look for, uh, well, production per country, but now we see um, WGIPA, this World Governance Index. Um, well, that measures political stability and the absence of terrorism and violence and stuff like that. So you have the political potential, which is just uh, quest questioning uh, mining companies, uh, how they well, measure how they think that the country, how stable the com th those companies think uh, those countries are stable or not. Is it difficult to, to have to, to mine in those countries or not? At the end, you have the risk of regulation, uh, which is very um, not un unsocial, actually. I take the Human Development Index, so if you have a 
high development uh, human development index and that means this land has, this country has a lot of regulation um, like Germany which has a lot of regulation for most um, areas and so it's very difficult to implement uh, new mining well ideas uh, quickly so this is why it's here as a risk and it's and a, a low human development index is seen as something positive in the ca in that case well that's why i said at the beginning you should look at eco ecologic and uh, social um points and but this is but because just economic values can be used but it's pretty well not nice so for the political stability you see three are pretty bad and tungsten is uh, very bad for the political potential you see there's a huge spike for tungsten again a potential sorry um, that's because the Fraser Institute um, which uses this uh, po political potential thing with they, they make the questionnaire and they try to do it in most dif in many countries but it's pretty difficult to to ask uh, mining companies in uh, countries that have civil wars because usually those companies then have different uh, problems uh, from just uh, d answering questionnaires and you can also uh, it's difficult to go to the mines and ask question uh, people so and also they just uh, well z well guess the values Again, as you have that for the regulation, three of them are pretty bad because there's a lot of regulation. Just Tantal is uh, good because the human development index in that case is pretty low where uh, Tantal is uh, exploited. So there's not a lot of regulation in such countries. So you could do easily implement mining projects in those countries. But the other factors work against this regulation, missing regulation. Okay, again, there's a graphic that is a bit chaotic and difficult to read. Uh, but I tried to color it to make it more easy, easily understandable. So the colors tell you if it's good or bad. Uh, so this is from another project, uh, this AHP, H, well, which, whatever. AHP. Yeah, we just uh, weighted those uh, values and then summed them up at the end, and we see that the tungsten is really bad. Um, so, and it's a high risk. Yeah. Also, gold uh, is fair, well goes pretty well because it's uh, exploited and mined in many countries. So, if you see the box diagram, you see still everything is rather well above uh, the medium. So, which should which is better than we have seen from the single uh, indicators than from the European Union? There's on the right side. You also see uh, a graphics, and what they found out is that. Uh, Tungsten has a huge supply risk and is also very important for the economic zone of Europe. Uh, interesting is that uh, gold is uh, very low on uh, economic importance in this analysis. Um, so, but otherwise, it's it's pretty similar. But we uh, we s looked at it. We said it's a bit more critical than this European uh, report says. Well. So, now about, uh, well, what we can do, what kind of company do, what kind of country do, to, well, make this more safe and to, to work against those factors. So we have three big categories in the center of this for all of four of those materials. Well, it's just research and development and recycling, that's on the left top. Everything we can recycle and don't have to report is good for a country because that means we don't uh, support uh, conflicts in other countries. We just have like a cycle in in Germany, which so there's no political. We can't be like extorted politically, and we don't support uh, wars and conflicts. So in a long-term perspective, that's good. We can also try in the left bottom uh, while developing substitutes and uh, a circle economic system. 
So, it's, so if I can uh, substitute, a, uh, uh, well, any resource by another one, that makes me much more flexible. And so this is good for recycling as well. And it's like the basis for re recycling, because only if I have like a circular economic system, um, I can actually recycle stuff, especially in technology. Um, it's difficult. Actually, you may return uh, electronic devices, but not all uh, well, sellers actually do this, and you can turn the man back, but you don't really know what happens with this. So maybe some of those uh, like, uh, well, broken devices or thrown away devices are just exported back to Africa. Um, so which is not good. So this is it's not good if we bring just our if we if we ship our garbage to other countries, but if you just uh, well, recycle them. On the right hand side, these are a bit more like specific, especially for tungsten, which is uh, uh, is useful to make a reverse integration, meaning you set buy um, companies that are um, that are earlier in the supply chain than I do. Um, I can also invest in those uh, in companies or make like long-term contracts so that I know that the well, that the supply is made secure and I'm not, uh, yeah, so the country can. Yeah. And the last one, I, uh, well, just uh, storage and diversification. Actually, that's only useful for Tantal. And because if you if the, you know that there's a political conflict coming and maybe a war, then you have some time to um, switch countries for your supply and stuff like that. So that's why it's useful if you have, if you have, uh, well, a storage of it. Especially um, all those conflict resources, the European Union, um, well, it well made themselves forced itself to uh, to prohibit and to not use resources that are uh, well exploited and mined in uh, problem countries. Um, for example, in mines. Um, Okay, to the future of the methodology. Uh, this time I looked more into it in the methodology this time, but also I see the problems on the methodology. For example, there should be a social and ecologic um, indicators that should be weighted in as well. Also, we need a better data bases because currently some um, things we can say about are difficult to say. So. For example, we uh, now we can say where do we actually need data, so we can analyze it better. Also, the uh, that um, we have to take care of our different um, resources as well. For example, not just the three the TG materials, but other resources as well. For example, cobalt. Should we add that or not? That this is a discussion right now. And finally, the methodology should be um, un standardized to make a standard um, quality analysis. I presented to you one today. Um, you already saw that the European Commission also um, picked one that works. Uh, the um, results are somewhat similar, but not the same. So there is more research required to, for example, um, get more precise measurements. Okay, and with that, it's the end for this presentation. But that's not the end of the world, luckily. So, uh, at the start of the talk, I said, uh, when does the bomb uh, explode? Uh, it's not now, so you can go home and have a good sleep. So we have some years um, to solve the problem. So to um, extinguish the lid. Um, Okay, I am now, if you want, you uh, can question me things. Also, if you want to um, help me with my podcast, um, uh, Resource and FM, um, or maybe if you just want to help me, if you're in the area uh, of expertise, just uh, go to my website, and there you can find more information about the regulatories and criticality analysis. Thank you very much. Okay, this uh, was the talk um, about resource criticality from the 36C3. Um, your translators were Afro Sun, Sebelis, and Dimitri.
If you have feedback to us, um, please uh, tweet to us with the has hashtag uh, C3Lingo. Thank you very much. And now okay. we make questions and answers. Signal Angel wants to know about recycling technologies. And well, yes and no. The technology technologies exists it, it exists in some areas. Some are experimental. Uh, for example, regarding batteries, that is a huge problem that's being hyped a lot these days. People say they cannot be recycled, uh, they're not normed. It is basically possible. There are pilots, but it's simply not worth it at the moment. It's more, it's cheaper to import new materials because the materials are cheap and the external costs are not included in those market prices. And if more research will take place, then the process will become cheaper. And regarding capacities, some are there, but not as many, not enough to have a hundred percent coverage. And uh, there's nothing, nothing, nothing prevents these capacities from being built up. And uh, this has to be done for other, had to be done for other waste processing activities. Okay, substitution, that factor is um, very underestimated and has been underestimated and can destroy all these numbers. So now all the statistics, uh, for example, the electro engine from Tesla, um, in a quarter year they produced an uh, engine without neodine and they um, publicly made the patent available. So it can go really quickly for substitution if the prices go up. For example, uh, lithium, um, to my knowledge, there is a an, an, um, facility built that is working completely without it, because uh, is recycling them because it already is um, profitable. Um, contrary to the arguments of our auto industry that says it's not possible. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Regarding substitution, yes, you can substitute a lot of materials, but the question then is the availability of those substitute resources. At some point, you have gone through the whole periodic table of elements, and yes, well, it is a factor, of course, and they, it has huge potential, but still, I think that recycling economy is something to look at because, well, maybe uh, it will, won't uh, drop on our feet in 50 years' time, but maybe 100. So um, you have to think about recycling. Uh, which role could um, asteroids or moon uh, play? Because there is theoretically a huge potential, right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it, it sounds quite spaced out, but yes, there are many projects. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Yes, in the long run, it surely will make sense. We have limits on Earth, and at some point we will have exhausted all resources. We are very far away from that point now, but uh, we have a thin crust, which we still haven't drilled through, but still, the question is, which is more simple? Shall we take a meteorite and uh, exhaust that, or, or exploit that, or shall we drill further into the ground? And for some materials, such as rare earths, it does make sense to think about long-term strategies of mining in space. Uh, on the other hand, a rocket launch does take a lot of materials and uh, money, and there are ecological questions. But in the long run, if we think about colonizing Mars, for example, then we won't be able to carry all the materials from Earth to Mars. We'll have to exploit Mars as well. And there is a question from the Internet. The IRC wants to know how does it look with the um, CO2 emissions and energy um, in the recycling compared to new uh, resource gathering, for example, aluminium, which um, is known for being very energy uh, intensive. Uh, yes, with aluminium, interestingly, uh, it's the iron ore mining that takes more energy and produces more emissions because it takes um, uses more energy. So CO2 emissions and energy can be regarded as the same uh, equivalent, especially where energy is not gained or produced in a renewable, in a sustainable way. 
with aluminium, it takes a lot of electricity to get it from the iron ore, and that is one of the materials that has the highest recycling rates because it's more, it's cheaper to reuse it and it, it produces less CO2 as well. Uh, and regarding steel, the, the ThyssenKrupp company is trying to become carbon neutral and they want to use a hydrogen process. But of course, if that works, why not use recycling too? It may not seem that great for now, but it makes sense to do it in the medium term too. Okay, next question from Mike too, please. Okay, what's the um, terrible thing that could happen to our resources? For example, like peace in Africa and everything is gets more expensive or <laughs> the question was, what is the most dangerous thing that could happen to us? For example, what would happen if there is peace in Africa and everything gets more expensive because of that? Mm, well, no. Actually, no. Because clearly the war uh, is responsible for very bad living conditions in Africa. So that is not something we can laugh about, really, I should say because there is a lot of drama, human drama involved there, and if people then ha have a better life, they will demand uh, higher wages. And if people are put in forced labor, of course, they will not receive top wages, sure. So yes, it, will, it would become more expensive, but first, we cannot foresee peace coming very soon, very, very sadly. We've had wars there for decades in various parts of the world, and I don't really see that ending from one day to the next. And also, well, so what? Currently, we still have prices for many materials that are quite low. And if we talk about this, uh, if we talk about complete equality across the whole world, I would assume that up to that point, by that time, we will have the recycling technologies as well. And okay, there's a question from the internet, from IRC as well. Can you say something about political concepts to um, s prevent the trade of electronic waste? Uh, yes, well, there is. Well, what is the current problem? We have electronic waste that is lying around in. German or European recycling f facilities or collecting facilities and are waiting to be put to use, which could also Im include uh, burning and depositing. Of course, recycling would be better. And what, what does happen a lot and again and again is that electronic waste is taken from these facilities and taken by people that work there in part and then sold on. And we have rules to prevent this but the understanding isn't quite there yet. If people say, I want to buy this certain device, then they don't quite understand why they should not do that. And the fact that this ends up in Africa and, and children are then trying to ply certain wires out of that waste, or that's something we don't see. And we should step up surveillance of these facilities. But actually, we have the means and the legal foundations already in place. So maybe there is a lack of political will to actually enforce these rules because it is a question about, well, say, plastic waste, where should it go? If we can take it to China, well, that's a convenient way of dealing with it. And if I, as a municipality or a region or a country can do this, then maybe it will look better. And soon, as, as long as the population is not rising up against these practices, then for your politicians will care. Uh, regarding electronic waste, there's a very good movie about this. Welcome to Gomorrah, out to Sodom. I can recommend this. Uh, it deals with it, it puts a light on the status quo and, and what could be done. And I can only support this. Uh, it's an impressive movie. Uh, next question. Okay, thanks for the presentation. I have a question. The height of these indicators at the end, they are um, related to the weighting uh, factors as well. So, could you explain how these weights are obtained? Where do you get them from? Because you yep. did not. We have a paper that we wrote about it and we tried out various factors in that 
and we decided upon this HP weighting weighing weights. Uh, this is about having a survey of experts that are regarded as important and put very simply the question it's a choice of A or B with each question and that gets you to the information which weight should be higher and that leads to the generating of these factors and I can then see if someone goes and uh, would just write down the weights for these 11 factors that would be a very spontaneous decision and uh, this in contrast is the synthesis synthesis of these different expert opinions uh, I didn't do these myself these were done in the Institute where w did this study did that answer the question uh, also regarding this we uh, took other weights for, for an equal distribution for example and paid around the results changed surprisingly little uh, they perhaps 10 more or less but what was in the middle region remained there and these are factors that try to measure things that are at a very high level if we talk about countries we have a statement which is important and makes sense but you could drill it down much more in much more detail and much more exactly and uh, like I say we connected various sources with each other with which are very far apart sometimes okay question microphone one uh, we heard a lot about the three TG resources are there other critical resources or are those the critical resources or could you please say something about oil maybe uh, yeah, right. When I wrote the paper with the two colleagues, with Ingrid and Marie, we looked at the three TG materials because we thought, well, to look at them all would be too much of an effort, and other groups looked at other materials as well. The three TG materials are, did quite well in comparison. There is a diagram from the European Commission. Well, they did another one. Um, where they said everything down there is critical and interestingly uh, all the dots are in, in the same box there were only two that were not regarded as three that were not regarded as critical and they probably looked at the materials that they regarded as crit critical from the start so the question is where do you draw the line uh, where which value is critical and what does that mean and this methodology makes it easier if you as a company uh, have determined these strategically important materials then for these 10 you can run this kind of analysis and then say okay maybe we should look at tungsten or whatever and uh, we, so you can weigh this up and overall you have to look at all materials now regarding oil uh, as you mentioned it that is difficult because it's an energy resource as well because the so the price for oil is not really coupled to the material use of it in the industry which is great normally don't misunderstand me oil is a fantastic material you can do produce so many cool products from it and we just burn it that is kind of crazy in 100 years we we'll probably tell our own children what how silly were we uh, we have if this great material that we're not using properly and it's hard to run this kind of analysis because so many other factors get involved and uh, Oil, of course, can be a conflict resource as well because it can support conflicts. If we look at oil-rich countries, we have the problem of the <laughs> the resource curse. You can Google that. Uh, if if you have countries that exploit one material intensively, you, these tend to be non-democratic or absolutist um, and despotic in in their governance. Does that answer the question? Otherwise, come to me after the talk. Uh, yeah, thanks for the um, presentation. Uh, what's about the factor uh, to um, use products more efficiently, like the own car, for example? Yes. That too is difficult, I believe. How should I measure it in the first place? Well, uh, 
that makes it hard to start with. And also, there's often a kind of rebound effect. So you have more efficient use, maybe, regarding LEDs, for example. We have LEDs everywhere now. Why? Because they are cheap and they use less electricity, and they do produce very nice light. But now you have LEDs hanging everywhere. Now, whether electricity consumption has reduced is difficult to decide. And sometimes it's not the case, because when a technology gets cheaper and energy use is more efficient, we use more of it and not less. So, and again, inefficiency often comes with an increase in use. And electric cars, again, uh, the suspicion is that as soon as we have it, we will use them more. Why shouldn't we, of course? And oil prices are a bit too high anyway at the moment. That is my opinion. Did, did that answer the question? Okay, and there is another question from the internet. The IRC asks, how many small countries in the poorer, cu poorer countries um, which extract resources are there or uh, how big does the company need to be to be in that market? Well, which market is the question about? Uh, in mining itself, I would say one person. So one person can start mining uh, because the materials may not be that deep in the ground. So small-scale mining is possible if you just take <laughs> pickaxe, pick something you can start. So, and you have multinational corporations exploiting a country. Uh, it's not. It's it's of course bad if people force people into labor and. If you have people in artisanal and small-scale mining, um, how many companies that is, is difficult to delineate because often these are not listed. But there are estimates, but honestly, I don't have them uh, in my head at the moment. I could look them up. And the question is, where does one company begin and the other end? Maybe you have several companies in the same mine. But that, of course, is the ambition of the EU and other countries to have this diligence and uh, exercise diligence and get people out of slavery and have them work in a self-determined way and have them enjoy the fruits of their work as well. So there are communities that are company-like and get together and how many multinational corporations there are, again, that is hard to assess because Regarding 3TG, I would have to guess. I really don't know, honestly. Okay, mic number one. Uh, you showed really nice that, for example, like work security or um, environmental impact does not really play any role. And you also said that you want to integrate that. So how would you do that? And if we would do that? Would then li not like the artificial price bit explode? Yes, I mean, uh, well, including the price. For example, uh, if a tantal is mined, um, um, so there we have to look at radiation levels, and then they we need special uh, suits for that, and you have to uh, educate the people and all the illnesses, and you have to all f all factor that in and like also the working conditions, how would that uh, f f impact um, our prices? It would get more expensive, yeah. And there's also the question uh, how much can recycling and substitution can uh, well bring for that. So this is why I said it's important to do that. Of course I can't uh, get tell you like a s price, but a real number. I would be very surprised if anyone could tell you s a real number. How would you want to integrate it into the future, was my question. How would you um, value or weight it in? Okay. So there's already the idea. It exists as an idea. So this is uh, ecological factors. Um, it says eco-invent database. And they, uh, well, well, they have some environmental numbers like yeah, okay, you can read the, the, the 
The uh, same thing can be done for social dimension and the like, risk of uh, child labor, control of corruption, um, right to freedom of speech. Um, what we did, we didn't do it for two reasons now in this. Uh, first reason, because we were lazy, no, that was fun, number one. Uh, because it wouldn't, uh, it would just uh, make the, the, the work too big. In my bachelor thesis, um, I, I did this, um, where I just made it about aluminium. It's very hard to, to, to have those factors as, uh, well, uh, important and as some uh, reliable. Um, and you don't know how this data is uh, measured and uh, whether it's reliable or not, but something it's rather uh, easy. Um, we had like uh, CO2 emissions, so that's, uh, that's easy to measure. Yeah, there you have standards, so that's possible. But like for human toxic toxicity, uh, well, there can be some tests, but that's never the, the reality, that never really f is the reality on, on the ground. And the risk of child labor, for example, in the social dimension, I can include that, but how can I quanti quantify it? Can I actually quantify it? Or is not just actually each single child that is forced to do child labor uh, too bad? So are we, are we as a society ready to say that uh, a single child uh, has to suffer because we want our technology? So this is so this is very difficult to, to include all of this, but so yeah, it will be it will get more expensive. Uh, but can we uh, can we morally well sustain the idea that we don't want it to get more expensive? Yeah, thanks for that sentence. So there is not we're out of time left. So there is one question that I want to um, be asked. Yeah, the IRC asks. Um, how was it with the search for um, the um, resources on garbage sites? So, uh, so we did some research in that. We looked into that, but it's very difficult for several reasons. Um, there's a podcast episode from I did about uh, well this. One of the main bases, uh, one of the main problems is that we don't know where these garbage collections are. Um, if you know, for example, in Germany, uh, there has been, you know, that the, there it's, it's difficult to think because, for example, we had the Second World War, and uh, we know that they they made a lot of garbage collections, um, and we just we today we just don't know where they have been. So they just uh, well they just put all the garbage below the next hill. So we don't know where they are. We don't know what's in there actually, but no one really knows that. So uh, it's very rarely that um, s that it's really tracked which uh, resources are where. Now people start doing it, but um, so now we have a legacy problem. Actually, we have old systems which are not on the newest uh, status, and so that's why we don't know. So, for example, in, in also in buildings, uh, we want to re we want to recycle uh, parts of buildings and material of buildings, but we actually don't know what's in the, these buildings. What are the materials in there? So, for example, if you have a garbage uh, collection thing in the close to to Frankfurt, uh, someone killed his wife uh, and um, put her into the garbage. Um, and uh, the police found the murderer because uh, they knew exactly which uh, el which uh, well where which, which garbage was went where yeah but that's a huge uh, thing to do it's a lot of work so unfortunately we're done by now so the time is time is ended big applause okay thank you this is the end of our translation. Thank you.